and then just click pause. I'm waiting for others to file in. We're recording this webinar, so it'll be available at a later time and date at your convenience. Maybe, Chris, you can tell us when we hit critical mass. It's uh, 331 now. Yep. Both are filing in at a kind of a rapid pace. I'll let you know when it, once it's slowed down. Thank you. And everybody, I know you can hear us. We're, uh, as you just heard from Chris Rogers, he's monitoring. Everybody who's lo logging on to the WebEx, and when we see it subsiding, uh, we will start the show. Looks like Cheyenne misuse if you're on and your audio is working. Give us a shout. Shyam, are you able to hear us? Hey there, can uh, can folks hear me? It's Shyam. Yeah, perfectly, Shyam. How are you? Great. Good. Good. So uh, we're live right now. We're just waiting for everyone to file and Chris Rogers is going to give us the green light when we should go. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Sure. For those of you who are just joining, we're just waiting a couple of minutes. Um, people are still filing in. And when that cadence gets slower, we will then begin. Chris, how many people do we have thus far? We're up to 140. All right, I think what I'll do is stabilizing. I'll start at 335. How's it looking, Chris? It's it's slowing down. I think we can we can probably get started. 
Okay, great. Well, it is 335, so let's stay true to word. Um, everybody, thank you so much for joining. My name is David Sandbank. I'm the Vice President of Distributed Energy Resources at NYSERDA. I do have several colleagues of mine from NYSERDA on the phone as well. We've got Doreen Harris, who's my counterpart. She is the Vice President of Large Scale Renewables. She's going to be saying a few words in a minute. And I've also got Jason Doling, who's the Assistant Director of Distributed Energy Resources, uh, who will be contributing during this presentation. Uh, we have Chris Rogers, who is uh, a little bit of our MC and, and helping uh, a lot in the background, and so is Leslie Palzanello. Um, so thank you everybody for joining. Um, this is obviously uh, an important WebEx webinar because it really signals a green light to get back to work in a lot of areas for a lot of industries. Um, it's been really hard for everybody uh, in every industry and in every family and every business and every household. So uh, I'm glad that we're sort of seeing some light at the end of the tunnel and we can get back to work for the most part. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you, Leslie. So here's our agenda. Uh, I don't think this will take longer than 20 to 30 minutes to go through the entire agenda, um, but we'll do so, an intro and some table setting. We're gonna go through New York Forward, uh, which is, I think a lot of people know about it, so I'm not gonna like spend a lot of time on that, but that's how the governor has laid out the plan for reopening the economy. And then a uh, critical part of this is abiding by the Department of Health construction guidelines. So we're not gonna go through every page of those guidelines. We're just gonna give the resources and information that you need to know and how to go through the guidelines and what you're responsible for doing and not doing. Um, how we're gonna um, be, you know, uh, the compliance and how we're gonna be enforcing uh, those guidelines and how it integrates with NYSERDA's programs. Then Shiam is going to jump in. His team has put and his members have put a lot of work into um, a supplemental guidance document that he's going to be presenting. Uh, it's a fantastic guidance document. It really, they put a lot of thought into it and it is more for the rooftop uh, developer and um, takes you through on a step-by-step -step basis on um, important guidelines to adhere by uh, in, in addition to the Department of Health construction guidelines. So it's much more catered towards your industry. And then we're going to open it up to a Q&A. Next slide, please. And I'm going to pause here for a second. Uh, Chris, you let me know if there's any questions or anything that say, I can't hear you or there's technical difficulties, OK? Because I don't have the chat box open. Will do. Thank you. All right, so here's our intro and table setting slide. Uh, this is a joint webinar hosted by NYSERDA. Um, both the large scale renewables team and the distributed energy resource team together in partnership uh, with uh, the solar and storage uh, trade groups. We have SIA, we have NYSEA, ACE New York, New York Best, and CCSA. From SIA, we have Mr. David Gall. From NYSEA, we have Shiam Mehta. Uh, from ACE New York, we have Ann Reynolds. From New York Best, we have Denise Sheehan. And from CCSA, we have Erica Nidowski. And so um, they are panelists. We are going to offer them up just like we did on the last format to ask questions ahead of us taking the chat box questions so that we can get um, some, a lot of the main questions out of the way before you have to ask in the chat box. So it hopefully minimizes um, some of your questions. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what I'd like to do, um, you can stay on that slide, thanks, is I'd like Doreen to jump on, um, please. I, Doreen, I know you'd love to say a few words to the group. Great. Yeah, thank you, David. And um, thank you all for joining us today. You know, it's, it's um, as David said, it's, a, it's, it's very um, good news in New York that we're at a point where we are now talking about New York Forward and specifically how renewable energy and energy storage projects can be used as a tool really in the rebuilding effort that our state um, is now beginning to undertake. It's It's been um, obviously an incredibly challenging time and, and 
you know, we in New York and we specifically at NYSERDA certainly want to convey our continued support for the industry that we um, that we see again as as a critical tool in our toolbox to not only achieve our ambitious clean energy goals, but also, as I said, to rebuild our economy. And so, you know, we specifically are excited today, David and I, to come together, um, given that really this is, this is a combined industry. It's an industry that together is um, is poised really to, to get back to work. And, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, but we together know that this work needs to be advanced safely in a way that does not introduce risk um, into our our obviously our efforts to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. And therefore, you know, we're appreciative of your of your attention um, and your commitment to adhering to the guidelines that Governor Cuomo and New York have set forth at, at, toward the achievement of this objective. So um, David, um, please uh, thank you for taking uh, the lead here with um, the slides. And, and I just wanted to sort of reinforce the fact that we're here to talk about every type of project um, in the universe of renewable and energy storage, from the smallest residential project to the largest offshore wind project and everything in between. And so um, again, we're excited um, you've joined us today and, and thank you again. Uh, David? Thanks so much, Doreen, appreciate that and uh, great words. So um, Leslie, I think we can go to the next slide. This is all about New York Forward. Uh, how the state has planned a reopening led by the governor. I think a lot of you have seen the daily briefings. And uh, one thing I think we could all agree on is that uh, this is such an organic situation and constantly changes. So, um, you know, a slide done yesterday could be uh, stale today. So we all have to do our due diligence to constantly stay up to date on what the latest is. And here's the latest. So. Um, this is activities allowed statewide. Um, really what this is saying is that any project with a NYSERDA contract, so for the sake of any of the large scale renewable projects or the distributed energy resource projects, whether it be uh, New York Sun storage or on-site power are allowed to move forward statewide, except for residential um, may not begin unless um, phase one in a particular region has been open. I'm going to, I'm going to go through this more, but really with this slide has a lot of words on it. What this boils down to is the only thing that is right now on hold is residential solar for New York city, because the other regions are all have already hit phase one. So a lot of words here. What this means is all renewables storage, and NYSERDA projects can move forwards except for solar residential in New York City now. Um, so, um, and we're gonna get through that a little bit later on. There was a letter sent out um, and the link to that letter is right there in that slide. I, I do understand some people have been asking in the chat box, will this presentation be recorded? Uh, and downloadable. And yes, the answer is it will be, it is being recorded and you will be able to download this presentation off our NYSERDA nice site. Next slide, please. Thank you. So when we talk about regions, the state is divided up into different geographical territories by counties that are grouped into these 10 different regions. Each region has a control center um, that is responsible for making decisions. And again, I'll get into that on the next slide. But if you're curious about what region you're in and you say, well, what's up with uh, Westchester County, um, then you know that you're in Mid Hudson. Okay, next slide, please. And I will say, um, Doreen and Jason, please jump in at any time uh, to add color to what I'm saying or change the color <laughs> of what I'm saying, please. Um, this is New York fo uh, Forward Phase 1. This slide I did a couple days ago, and it's stale already. Last I looked this morning, um, in the metrics met where it says 7 out of 7, Every single one except for New York City is now seven out of seven, which is green. 
Um, so this is, as I said, stale already. It's a moving target. You see the link on the bottom there. The link on the bottom, if you uh, go to that link, it'll be updated, uh, I believe, even hourly. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a hot document and dynamic and changes a lot. What this is saying is there's key um, data points that each region has to abide by to enter phase one, right? So if you look at the top, it says the capital region. It's got check marks across all different um, you know, data points there. And that means it is allowed to open up to phase one. Phase one was construction, manufacturing, and curbside pickup retail. And I think there's a lot of other little things in there too, but for the most part, those are the, the key aspects. Um, so you, right now, every region is in phase one with the exception of New York City. So in New York City, what can be done right now? You can do storage projects, you can do solar projects, you can do efficiency projects, but not residential solar. So as long as they're commercial projects, you can do them in New York City now. And that is, so it's a little confusing because there is on a prior slide, we said renewables on and nice sort of projects are allowed to be accepted and doable statewide, except for residential solar. So that takes precedence over this chart when it comes to New York City. So what you need to know is when you see New York City and you see it's not green yet, still allowed to do renewable work there, but you just can't do residential work in New York City right now until New York City enters phase one. And looking at the metrics and the data, it's really close to phase one. I'm not someone who can speculate when that would happen, but I don't think it's gonna be far from now. Um, I'm going to pause there, Jason. That was a mouthful. I'm going to ask you if if I got everything in a clear and concise way enough or if you want to jump in. I think you did get everything clearly. Um, there's one question that came in on this slide, and it's something that uh, we've been asked once before. And I unfortunately do not have a great answer for it unless you have a more updated answer, David. Yeah. Um, what's with in Yep, in, in New York City, when we say uh, residential solar cannot begin until it enters phase one, um, the question has been whether multifamily buildings, uh, residential buildings, is considered residential solar or if that's considered commercial solar. Yeah, that is a good question. I'm not sure I do have the answer to it. I think the spirit of not residential is... Um, don't want to get into homes, right? As much as yeah, that's, commercial that's the project. same perspective that I I have had. I've tried to get uh, an a definitive answer to that, and I have not gotten that yet. But um, considering that a lot of these commercial buildings are mixed use and they have businesses and they have residential, um, I have personally had the same view as as you. But I will say for the person answering that question, asking that question, if they want to. A definitive answer. Um, we can try to get back to them. I just haven't gotten one yet. Okay, and Jason, it sounds like your Bluetooth device is not optimal right now. So if you have another way to connect audio-wise, that would be great. We did hear everything you said, but it was a struggle. Okay, we'll do. Thanks. Okay, and we're going to take. I see some questions coming in. We'll take those questions at the end so we can get through this. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, so this is regional monitoring. What this is saying is this slide that you saw previously, keep checking it when you wanna see updates. NYSERDA, Department of Health, um, we're not gonna be sending email alerts to anybody on these guidelines. And this, this, those, those green check boxes, they can go forwards from red to green, and they can also go green to red. And I think an important thing to understand here um, because I, I have been asked before, what happens if um, a, let's say, you know, mid-Hudson Valley goes green, we start construction, and then let's say one checkbox goes red, does everyone have to stop? 
it's my understanding that each um, control center within each region has to make a decision what they want to do if they want to make any changes and stop construction or not. The only mandate from the governor is you have to reach the criteria of all green check boxes before you go to phase one. After you get to phase one, it's up to the regional control center to decide after you're through phase one, if there's any red check marks that come up and data that they're the ones who make the decision on whether or not they're going to go back and, and pause again or whether they feel it's not an urgent matter. Um, and so that's that's really how that works. I just wanted to make that clear. So we won't be um, sending any um, you know, notifications because it's such an organic situation. And it's really up to you to please maintain uh, a daily uh, monitoring process of that site. Next slide, please. Um, there, there's one other part that I did not mention, and I apologize, um, which is on a prior slide that um, when I talked about all renewable energy except for residential solar in New York City is not uh, is allowed. Um, I also want to say that in the past, up till recent, NYSERDA uh, did not allow single workers anywhere. And single workers on renewable projects and NYSERDA projects are allowed statewide, and that includes residential in New York City. So if you have a project that is residential and it's in New York City and you send a single worker, that is allowed. So again, that precedence on the other slide um, is, is actually, Leslie, if we can go back to that slide, I believe it was slide four. Okay. Uh, the next forward more, two slides forwards. Okay. Right here, if you see the last bullet, activity by a single worker who is the sole worker on a project site, that is allowed across the board statewide for all of your projects. Okay, thanks, Leslie. We can go forwards a couple slides. Okay, one more. Okay, one more. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna get into the New York State Department of Health construction guidance document. And again, it's a you can download it. We're gonna have all the links on this page. You can also just Google NYSDOH construction guidelines. You'll find it. Um, let's, we're not going to go through the guidelines. Um, you all can read that yourself and determine how it affects you. Uh, but we are going to tell you what you're, you're responsible for and not responsible for. So next slide, please. Great. So um, the construction guidance, it was issued on May 13th. And there is the link with the full version. Okay, so it's a PDF. Um, and what this is all about is allowing New York to go back to work without further spreading the coronavirus and doing it in the safest way possible. So this is giving uh, your customers, your workers, our state peace of mind that we can get the economy moving again, get your jobs moving again, get back to normal as fast as possible, but doing so in the safest manner possible under a standardized approach. So everyone's adhering to the same guidelines. This is critical. Um, there are minimum requirements um, and you could, if you're an employer and you want to increase them and make them more strict because you have better ideas, you're free to do that. But at a minimum, you have to adhere to the uh, guidelines from the Department of Health. Um, you also, of course, have to adhere to all local, state, and federal requirements relative to construction activities. Um, and, you know, you're responsible for staying current with any updates of these requirements. So uh, stay in touch with Department of Health. I'm sure if anything changes dramatically, we would let you know about it. Uh, but do, again, uh, you know, follow those instructions and keep an eye on that. Thanks. Can we go to the next slide? Great. So um, all construction related clean energy worker activity commencing as part of the phases must adhere 
to the construction guidance, right? So um, this is mandatory. It's not, I know it says guidance, but it is mandatory. It's mandatory for the state. And it's also mandatory for the programs at NYSERDA and anyone who has a contract with NYSERDA. Um, so you definitely have to, um, you know, adhere to those guidelines. The other item, and I'm going to get into these later on in the slide, um, is a development of business safety plans. Each participating contractor uh, is mandatory that you have a safety plan. And again, we're going to get into that on a future slide. There is a template that the state's going to provide to make it easy for you. In order, uh, there is really one item that you must do as an attestation. And that item is each one person from each firm doing business in the state. You have to complete an online affirmation form attesting to the fact you have read and understood the obligation to operate in accordance with the guidelines um, from New York State Department of Health. That is the one thing you have to do as an attestation measure, okay? And uh, really important that you could be a storage company, you could be a wind company, you could be a solar company, and you hire subcontractors. It's not good enough that the contractor just uh, attests. Your subcontractors need to attest. Anybody who is a separate entity or a separate company that works with you, make sure they do the attestation as well so you don't get in trouble, okay? Um, and um, these guidelines are also going to be reflected and integrated into NYSERDA's laws and, well, I should say rules in programs. So, for instance, with New York Sun, it'll be uh, in our program manual. And I assume, Doreen, on your side of the shop, it might be in, in a contractual language. I'm not sure, but you can jump in. Um, but there is going to be um, editing on our end. I think we, we've got that ready to queue up and go. It will be enforced by NYSERDA. So if there is somebody complaining about a particular company, let's say they weren't wearing face masks or they just weren't adhering to the rules, NYSERDA has the right to uh, come down with disciplinary action, just like we would if you were breaking some quality assurance rule or other program rule. Doreen, did you want to touch on any part of that, on how that works on your side of the shop? No, you're correct, David. Um, thank you. In saying that in this, in the instance of our um, renewable, large-scale renewable energy contracts, um, this would be a contract by contract um, enforcement mechanism because of the fact that we don't have a overarching program manual through which to apply this enforcement. But but the the basic approach is the same. Thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Great. Um, so the standards of re for re uh, standards for responsible construction activities in New York State. No construction activity can occur without meeting the following minimum standards, as well as applicable federal requirements, including but not limited to. This is like the my lawyer part of me. Um, basically, you could read this. I don't have to read it out loud, but it's just saying that you really have to abide by these measures, um, where the measures came from. We're not just making this up. Um, obviously, um, it's coming some, from a lot of uh, trade groups and uh, federal um, organizations that know a lot about safety and health. Um, okay, so um, these standards are um, whether you're an essential worker or a non-essential worker, it doesn't matter. Anybody out there doing work has to abide by these in the construction industry. Next slide, please. Okay, here's the attestation portion of the guidance. It's really easy. Uh, I clicked on it. It's a few questions. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes. Um, that is the link right there. Um, that, uh, again, to remind you, one person from your company needs to do this, um, fill out the information. It literally takes a few minutes. It's not hard to do, uh, so I encourage everybody to do it. Um, as my wife always says, do it while you think of it. So when we get off um, this WebEx, do it then uh, if you haven't done it already. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so here's the safety plan. 
this is a template that you see an image on the right hand side what it looks like that template is for you to use if you'd like to use it um, it is a plan a safety plan that is required uh, for you you have to have that um, you know posted at the site of construction very important it's got to be plain and very and visible uh, like you would put a building permit up or something just put this right where the building permit is um, but this is your um, safety plan and everybody who comes to the site should be able to see this and read it uh, the plan must include owner and hr representative it's contact information it's simple um, identification of social distancing and safety measures taken managing engagement with customers and site visitors personal protection equipment quantities cleaning storage and disposal measures cleaning log site visit log responsibilities hygiene station details daily health and screening contact tracing practices and other documentation of vitally important safety measures so i encourage you all to start with this template um, unfortunately, this is a sign of the times and it's a new world, um, but this is what's required now for uh, posting on your site and required for your company to abide by. So again, you can uh, get this at the Department of Health's website um, and download it. Next up, next slide. Oh, uh, stay there for a second. Um, this does the only thing required from you as far as proof that you've done something to either NYSERDA or Department of Health. You do not have to uh, send anything to NYSERDA. You don't have to send anything to Department of Health. You just have to do this. So if there's an inspector that comes to your site and this isn't up there, um, that's not good. Um, you just need to be responsible for doing it. You don't have to tell us you're doing it. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, compliance and enforcement. I've mentioned this before, we can breeze right through this. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so, as I said, uh, this is a lot of repetition here. Um, and I already mentioned that non compliance could result and will result in disciplinary action uh, by NYSERDA to the NYSERDA contractor um, or um, con construction company or company. So that's very important to know. Think of these guidelines as a program rule or a contract uh, agreement with, with Doreen, uh, large-scale renewable contracts. So you really got to take this seriously. Um, there is an area for individuals that can file complaints regar regarding the operation of businesses. And you can see the link there. Um, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, an online form. Or you can call that 800 number right there. Uh, in the first bullet point, uh, um, well, third bullet, first sub bullet, um, you could see that's where people would be calling. Um, and specific complaints from employees against their employers should be directed to the Department of Labor through their online form. And again, the link is there. So obviously, you can see there's a lot of important links here. Also, um, and then there's a link to compliant information um, there. I will say that on NYSERDA's website, when you first go to the website, there is a COVID-19 response um, you know, uh, window right uh, front and center when you land on the home page. If you click on that and you look at the resources there, it'll include all these links. You don't have to wait for this PowerPoint to be ready because sometimes through um, our government bureaucracy, it could take more uh, time than we wish. So don't wait on this. You can certainly go to uh, either the Department of Health's website or um, Department of Labor's website, or easy, you can go to NYSERDA's website, hit the COVID-19 um, New York Forwards um, you know, banner there, and you'll have access to all these links. Next slide, please. Okay, this is where you all get a break from my voice. I'm going to pause here and ask Doreen and Jason if there's anything they'd like to add before we get into the NYSEA presentation. Thanks, David. Um, no, I, I think that was a great overview of where we are. Um, the one question that I receive fairly regularly that I'll just uh, get out there now is, um, is really, you know, when does construction commence, if you will, with regard to projects that have um, 
very long development cycles. So the question that we receive are, you know, is pre-development work included, for instance, in these scopes of, of activities that are allowed subject to the safety provisions you just described? Um, and so the answer is, is yes. Um, any aspect of a project, whether it be the very early surveys all the way through the construction of that project are, um, are now covered and, and allowed per the but per the conditions that David just described. Okay, thanks, Doreen. Uh, Jason, did you have anything to add before we hand it off to Shiam? I'm assuming that's no. Um, we can't hear you, Jason, but um, I think while you get your audio worked out, um, we're gonna hand it over to you, Shiam. Um, as I said earlier at the beginning of this um, webinar, you know, NICEA worked hard along with their members to put this together, and it's a really helpful guidance document. So, uh, Shiama, uh, can, can you uh, talk so we make sure we hear you? Yeah, David, can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Thanks, Shiam. Okay, uh, Shiam, uh, off to you. Just say next slide when you're ready to go to the next slide. Great. Thanks, David, and uh, thanks to the entire NYSERDA team for uh, putting this webinar together as well as for their leadership during uh, what continues to be a very challenging uh, time for the industry. Uh, although, again, the recent news and the reason we're doing this webinar is certainly extremely welcome um, from the industry's point of view. We've been eager and anxious to get back to work, and with uh, the notable exception that you mentioned, David, uh, we, we are uh, at that stage. So. Um, uh, and again, thank you for the opportunity to, to present some slides here on regarding some supplemental guidance. So um, just to be very clear, uh, you know, and I only have a few slides here, um, the, what I'm about to go into right now is uh, supplemental guidance. And unlike the DOH construction guidance that David just went through, uh, which is mandatory, this is uh, not mandatory. It's not binding. It, it, it is it, are, it, it is a recommendations that NICEA has put together with the input of our staff and members, uh, particularly I want to thank uh, Greg Sachs of Empower Solar who spearheaded this effort. So, um, and, and so again, it's not binding or mandatory. It, it, you don't have to follow any of this if you don't want to. Although I think, uh, you know, if you take a look at it, it is some very common sense basic uh, uh, guidelines for how to conduct um, uh, uh, visits with, uh, um, uh, for rooftop solar contractors. So if you can move to the next slide um, and move, and I can get into the, the meat of the subject matter here. So before we, we dive in just, and I'm not actually going to dive in here uh, into every single point, but there's, there's uh, two similar but separate sections we have here. Uh, the first one which you, which the slide here pertains to is best practices for uh, workers that are scheduling site visits for other employees in the residential and commercial, uh, uh, i.e. rooftop domain. And the second one is uh, contractors that are actually doing site work, whether it's at a, 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 at a home uh, or a workplace. So the first one, as I said, it's uh, with regard to scheduling visits for other employees. Um, and we're not, I'm not going to go into every single point. And you can see here just in general, you know, you, you, the recommendation one we have is to send the client uh, or client or clients, the published policies that we you have in advance. The second one is um, um, a, a basically a flow chart uh, or a series of steps uh, regarding making contact, following the basic welcomes, uh, just reading out uh, the information below, uh, making very clear that uh, you are aware of the current environment, the state of emergency, and the sensitivity of health hygiene and uh, and, 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 and appropriate protocols uh, with regard to COVID uh, that you, you, you and your uh, company have been monitoring the situation and are following the guidance uh, of uh, public health, federal and, and state authorities. Um, and so you can see here um, seven, seven sub points here uh, to just go down, walk down that list. And again, I, I believe it's extremely common sense here. There's nothing that is overly complicated. Uh, so again, not going to walk on every single point, but it, it is just basically uh, some basic uh, uh, points to run through as you make contact with the client. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. Uh, so following that that initial sort of contact, make contact list and introduction, uh, you'd, you'd want to move into 
uh, asking the client if anyone in their home or workplace has been exposed to COVID-19, uh, whether they're sick or exhibiting uh, the typical symptoms that are associated with COVID or, or flu-like conditions. Uh, if not, uh, that's great, and you can proceed as normal and schedule that site visit. If so, uh, that is, uh, uh, you, you would want to ask uh, a few following follow-up clarifying questions, uh, whether those, uh, those individuals that um, have been exposed to COVID or, or are sick or exhibiting uh, COVID uh, symptoms or flu-like symptoms, whether they're uh, currently or previously located in any rooms that you would be required to access. Uh, including uh, any spaces that you need access to. Um, and if that answer is yes, then uh, we, we strongly recommend you uh, apologize for the inconvenience, uh, but maintain that the policy that you have is that you postpone the site visit until those sick individuals can be re relocated to a different room or offsite where uh, your contractor representative will not uh, uh, have to encounter that individual. Uh, and then finally, for any scheduled site visits, uh, you'd want to provide any prior history or guidance uh, to the contractor rep who would be your colleague who'd be performing the site visit. So it's again a pretty simple list, and this is for folks who are scheduling site visits for other employees. Now, if you can go to the next slide, um, so that this is again a similar but separate uh, list of best practices for folks who are actually doing site work. So whether it's a contractor, field workers, uh, electrical technicians, site auditors, installers, and service personnel. So, um, and again, we have a similar list of points here. Um, you know, first of all, you, you want to heed any guidance uh, by the person who uh, uh, may have scheduled your work uh, following the site visit practices that we just went through. Uh, once you arrive at the site, uh, you definitely don't want to shake hands. Um, in, instead, uh, a kind head nod or bow should suffice uh, during these times. Uh, and then share a uh, sample statement with the client again. Uh, hello, and please know that uh, my crew, uh, if, if you have a crew on site, my crew and I are following the official contractor procedures to help uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19 and then move through another list of questions. Again, the next question is the same one that we went through with the workers scheduling site visits for others regarding any, whether anyone in the home or, or at that site, whether if it's a workplace has been exposed to COVID-19, is sick, exhibiting a fever, or have any cold or flu-like symptoms. Uh, again, if the answer is yes, you, you want to make sure, or you'd want to ask if they are currently or previously were located in any rooms that you'd be required to access. If so, you'd want to uh, postpone that site visit. If no, uh, you can proceed to the next question. And if we can move to the next slide here. So again, if, 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 yeah, so again, if someone is sick in the home or currently residing in a home that you'll need to access, um, or if you actually encounter somebody who is sick or exhibiting those characteristics, um, you do have the right to postpone your work duties and vacate the premises and site. Um, and uh, we have a sample statement in, 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 in italics uh, in, in step six here. Um, and so you'd want to jump straight to that if uh, the answer to question four is yes. Um, otherwise, um, uh, I'm actually moving uh, back up to step five here. Uh, if, if that is not an issue, again, if you're not if, if it's not the case that you have an individual or that is currently or previously um, uh, at any of the, the rooms that you need to access, uh, you'd want to provide a verbal agreement, uh, or you'd want you would want a verbal agreement provided to you by the client to the following requests. Uh, so you'd want to confirm that um, that the person who is sick will be absent and not residing in the room that you will perform work. Um, confirm that you will exercise social distancing practices at all times. Um, and if they agree to these requests, you can proceed with uh, your work. If they, if they do not or express concerns, again, you'll have to go to step six. Um, and if necessary, uh, you will have to decline entering the space uh, and uh, mention you'll be following, shortly, following up shortly to reschedule that visit. Um, and then the last thing that just worth mentioning is that if you do cut with that visit short or need to defer your work duties, uh, you, you should inform your supervisor uh, immediately prior to leaving the property. So hopefully this is pretty clear. It's pretty simple. It's got pretty common sense. Um, and we do believe that you know, it does go uh, slightly above and beyond what the DOH construction guidance is, and it is specific to our uh, industry, the rooftop solar industry. So you will find it helpful, valuable, and 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 uh, and beneficial 
as we resume uh, work across the state. And that, I think that, that is pretty much uh, the slides that we had for this purpose, David, so I'll turn things back over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shiam. I know a lot of work went into that. And uh, obviously, if anybody has any questions, you know how to get a hold of Shiam. Um, and uh, really good stuff. Great work. Thank you so much. OK, um, next slide, please. We're nearing the end of our webinar um, presentation now, and then we're going to get into Q&A very quickly. Um, here's some, on the next slide, here's some other resources and links that will be provided when you get this, um, when you're able to download this. And so that's obviously some good resources for you that's jam-packed into one slide. And, uh, next slide, please. And here's some federal uh, and industry um, links as well, some of which I'm sure you already know about and have already been to. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now what we're going to do is just pause here for a second, and like we did last time, we're going to reach out to the trade groups and allow them to ask questions first uh, on behalf of their members. So uh, I'm going to uh, start here with Dave Gall, um, and we'll go in order of your logo positioning on the prior slides. Um, so Dave, why don't you uh, kick in, and, and, and do you have any questions at this point? Great. Thanks, David. Yeah, I do have a couple of questions, but let me confirm. Can you hear me? We can hear you very well. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, David and Doreen and the rest of the NYSERDA nice staff. Um, appreciate you hosting this webinar. Um, again, I'm Dave Gall from the Solar Energy Industries Association. I work on the state affairs team at SIA and cover uh, New York State um, for the National Association. Um, and as, as Shiam uh, pointed out earlier, our firms are very eager to get back to work in New York. So this is uh, uh, great news and we're on the cusp of having uh, a statewide solar work resuming um, very soon. So that's, that's terrific news for uh, all of our firms. Um, I had two questions. Uh, one that's um, more of a clarifying nature uh, uh, based on some of the slides. And then I have a, a, a broader question that, I, that I'd like to ask based on uh, some recent um, ordering language from the Public Service Commission. So let's, but I'll start with the clarifying question first. Um, the, one of the slides referenced that um, uh, there's reopening of solar work uh, associated uh, with um, work pursuant to a NYSERDA contract or a program. And a couple of members have been reaching out and asking, you know, does this mean the project uh, has to be awarded in a, a NYSERDA incentive or a contract? Uh, in, in order to be eligible to resume. Uh, obviously, there are lots of you know, um, development projects that may need uh, upfront work that needs to happen before they're even in the application phase. So if you could just clarify um, uh, the, that issue, and, and uh, I think that would help a lot of, a lot of companies. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And uh, Doreen, you jump in too, or Jason, but from what I understand it, like let's say you're a solar project and um, you haven't reached the right project maturity to get uh, officially submit your project application to the New York Sun program. So you do not have an award letter. Um, does that mean you can't move forward? No, you can still move forwards with the project. Um, it, you know, it, it doesn't really mean that you have to have an actual um, application in with us. Um, otherwise, that really wouldn't make too much sense because you'd never be able to get there if you couldn't start it. Um, so we just are saying that if it's a project and it's likely to be a New York Sun project and you are, let's say, a contractor that has many projects with us already, um, you will be held to those guidance measures from the Department of Health, but you can continue to move forwards with projects that are not yet submitted to our program. I'll pause and see if uh, Doreen and Jason have any insight into that as well. Sure. Yeah, I, I think the the I, I would agree with that, David. I, I think for me the the situation that would apply also, you know, for consideration if a project is not yet under NYSERDA contract is that obviously the ESD, uh, the Empire State Development has been clearly um, the primary designee who is sort of defining these rules. Um, NYSERDA at times has 
uh, had you know different um, rules for our contractors, but but clearly in the case that you don't have a nice sort of contract, there are rules that are applicable through ESD regardless, which we now exactly align with anyway. So. Yeah, Doreen, that's a fantastic point. Mm -hmm. I think that's a better answer than mine. It's like we are fully aligned with ESD right now. Um, and we now are incorporating those rules into our programs um, so that if you break those rules, just like if you break a law or if you break a code, vi if you have a code violation, it still could be uh, disciplinary action from NYSERDA. So uh, Doreen's right. It, it's really more in line with ESD's guidance. Okay, that's terrific. Thank you for that uh, that answer. Very helpful. Um, so my second question is a little broader in scope, and we can take this one now, or we can address it at the end if you'd like. But the uh, the Public Service Commission, in their um, recent order expanding the New York Sun program, allocating funds to the New York Sun program, and um, in order to reach the six gigawatt goal, the the commission called for um, a report from NYSERDA to um address um to provide an update essentially on the impacts of the COVID-19 virus what what it means for the industry and so I guess the, the the question here is um you know how are you thinking about that report what information are you using to put that report together and then you know what can the industry do to help um provide some additional resources as you're you know you're preparing those documents thanks Dave I think it's a great question. It's a little bit outside the scope of this webinar. So I'm going to, what needs to be a, a longer conversation, I'm going to condense it a little bit. And of course, we can um, take this offline and you can talk to your members about it as well. But yes, you're, uh, you're right. Uh, as, as everyone knows, the six gigawatt order uh, was approved in the, in the order. Um, it was a very awkward time for that to happen. The timing wasn't ideal. And there's a lot of happening um, with COVID-19 pandemic that's affecting all industries all over the world. And so, um, uh, you know, we didn't know this pandemic was happening when we were talking to developers and getting project economics. We didn't know it was coming when we put everything together and we don't know how much of an effect or a lasting effect it's gonna have. So the commission felt it was important for us to um, 30 days after the order, so in a couple of weeks, we need to provide a report to the commission saying, here's what we know now. What we plan uh, as far as, you know, what we've learned, one of the pivotal uh, data points that we can use is the NICEA survey that was filled out by the NICEA members. I think Xiam got about 80 or so um, replies of companies doing business in New York State from all different sectors. So that was really good. We're going to rely on that. We're going to talk to obviously you, Dave, and, and your members and try to get the lay of the land. But the important thing here is we don't have to have it all figured out within 30 days. We're going to be able to tell them what we know at this point in time, but ask for, um, you know, Nicaea to do another report in, let's say, two to three months or survey, sorry. Uh, to give us some more information on what's happening. So this becomes more of an ongoing um, monitoring process than a single um, report within 30 days of the order. So uh, answer your question, Dave, we're going to work with stakeholders. We're going to work with uh, the trade groups like um, the people that are on this webinar to put together what we know now with uh, out uh, an ending to it um, so that we can, you know, sort of keep providing that, keep an eye on it and see how the industry rebounds. Does that, does that help? Yeah, thanks, David. That's, that's very helpful. And, you know, I think I can speak for the rest of my industry colleagues here when, when, you know, uh, when I, well, I'll say that we, you know, we stand ready to assist NYSERDA in, you know, understanding the impacts and providing good information. So happy to work with you folks going forward. Um, with that, I will, uh, 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 yield my time to other members of the trade associations. All right, Shiam, do you have any questions? Yeah, David, uh, thanks. Um, so I think uh, most of my questions actually you have covered um, in your your remarks while going through the presentation, but um, 
So I, the, the first couple I have are just con, con, confirmation questions. So, and I, you you all, you mentioned this multiple times, but I just want to make this very clear for folks who joined late that with regard to the statewide reopening of non-residential work um, and the regional reopenings we have in place. So uh, I just want to confirm that basically the only segment that is still paused as of this time is residential work in the New York City region. Uh, and that construction and pre-construction activities for solar and storage projects of all types is otherwise allowed as of now. That's correct with the caveat that residential work greater than one person is not allowed. Right, in New York City. In New York City, sorry. In New York City, yes, yes. And thank okay, you for great. echoing that and making it clear. Yep. Um, and then the second confirmation is, I, you know, we, 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 uh, Jason and you uh, took this question earlier, uh, but I just want to confirm that uh, we are still, um, uh, you, you will have an answer back regarding the designation of uh, multifamily units uh, and, and apartment buildings in, in terms of their classification as residential versus non-residential. Uh, given the New York City pause for residential is still uh, on, uh, um, is still on. I will do my best to get an answer. Sometimes it's hard to get an answer um, because these things sometimes are vague and then we have to sort of weed through it and find the authority, uh, the person who has authority to let us know. Um, but I will, um, I've been thinking about that question this entire presentation. So I will definitely do my hardest to get an answer back. Yes. Yeah, so there was a chat that came up, which seems to reinforce what's both of our perspectives, which is that if when an application is filed to Department of Buildings in a multifamily building, it's filed as a commercial application, a commercial solar application. So I see him, that, that seems to be the very best affirmation that that is the case. Uh, we, we've asked the question a few times as well and not heard anything different. Okay, and if, Jason, thanks. So, so just, sorry, David, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, if someone wants to chat in the box, whether what Jason said is true um, in uh, New York City primarily or some other cities, that would be helpful. No, that, that, that's where my answer just came from, David. Somebody right, I'm, at, I'm asking others to confirm. Because <laughs> there's different, um, it could be Buffalo, it could be New York City. Okay, yeah, so, so um, yeah, it, it seems what Jason is indicating and what we, we, we got from the chat was given the treatment in, at least in New York City, it, it may be the case that the multifamily units and apartment buildings may be considered commercial for, for this purpose. So, but we, we, we're, we I think uh, just getting a firm answer on that to the extent you're able to provide would certainly be, be great for, for the members we have that are looking through that work in the city. Um, so that's, that was my second question. And the third one is uh, just a clarification question. Uh, so, and, and it concerns the relationship of the statewide allowance of non-residential work um, and, and the relationship between that and these phase one reopenings. So, um, so basically the question is, you know, if let's say, unfortunately, if there's backsliding in the regions, which of course, God forbid that happens, um, you know, could the status of the statewide reopening of non-resi uh, be affected by that? Um, is, is the question really? Yeah. Um, hang on. I'm sorry. I am unmuted. Um, you know, it's been asked a lot in, and, and I'm going to give you my answer based on what I hear from the governor's daily briefings, which is it's a judgment call. And that judgment call has to come from those control centers, right? Which is a handful of selected people in each region. And if there's something where there's a slide backwards, but it's just cusping on red, and maybe it's a data point that um, is, 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 it feels that they know it's gonna be okay in the near future, they might just ride it out. If it's a data point where it's very clear indication that, whoa, we came back too soon, the virus now is spreading across multiple data points um, and affecting data point, multiple data points, that council will probably pause work. So again, the only thing that is absolute certain based on data is getting to phase one. When it comes to decision-making after that, it is truly up to those control centers 
and they are going to use the better judgment of what to do. Um, so, Shiam, I, I think that's the best answer I can provide. And um, the other answer is keep your fingers crossed and hope everything goes well. <laughs> Absolutely, David. So, yeah. Um, and so, and, and so the, the only sort of sub question I have there, and I'm um, uh, uh, happy to uh, hand the mic over to uh, my other uh, trade association colleagues, is uh, what, what would be the best resource for uh, information about, about um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, regions going from green to red, you know, again, God forbid that happens, but would that be the, these regional control centers? Um, like, is that, do you have any insight into how they're going to communicate these decisions? Um, not, I, you know, I think this was asked before. I'm not sure what the answer was, but number one, monitor the regional map, right? So that's important to know. So you have a heads up that um, if everything's green, you know, you're not going to have to worry about it. If you see it turning amber or red, you know that you have to worry about it. And I assume that there's been a ton of communication uh, from the state at this point as for regions opening and closing that it'll be abundantly clear in the daily briefings or through emails that that could happen. Um, so I'm not sure the channel will be through the control center. I'm sure they would probably go to state agencies to echo that message. Um, but if Doreen or Jason, you have a more uh, factual answer, uh, please jump in. I'm hoping it just never happens though. Sorry, yeah, I, David. Yeah, maybe ahead, Jason has some sage advice here. No, the only thing I was going to suggest is that that uh, uh, scorecard web page, which you put up the link for earlier, and uh, we will reiterate, reiterate what that is in a moment, which shows how each of the regions is doing on the seven metrics. That's really where I would go to. Um, there, there is a question feature on there. If there's a specific question that someone has related to a region, that will go directly to that control center. But I would also just echo, there's so much attention on this that if, God forbid, that should happen, I think it would be difficult to not know of it just in the uh, mainstream media alone. Yeah, Jason, that's a very good point. Um, so again, we'll, we'll continue tuning into the governor's daily briefings and keep a very close eye on that uh, regional dashboard that uh, you have mentioned. Uh, so thank you for that. And uh, like I said, I'll turn it over to my other colleagues now. Thanks. And again, just to re reiterate, I'm on the website live right now and the regional dashboard is updated and there's a green check mark on everything except for New York City, as I mentioned, and New York City is on the cusp uh, very close to um, getting there, um, but it goes forwards and backwards on a data point, like share of total beds available. You have to have a, uh, you know, hospital beds, you have to have a threshold of 30%. They're at 26%. Share of ICU beds, you have to be at 30%. They're at 29%. So um, it all depends on the beds right now in New York City, to be honest with you. Okay. Um, Anne, do you have questions? Anne Reynolds from Ace New York. Um, very briefly, hi. Uh, thank you for all your work and for all this information. My first question was the one that you just went through, and I, I think um, it is a concern to companies if they're gonna open up construction, reopen up construction at a large scale facility, will they have to shut it down again if the metrics change? But I understand we're asking you to predict the future and we don't know the answer to that question yet. Um, the other one was more of a confirmation, um, just because I, I do get clarifying questions from members that, um, and this has been said, that construction is widely defined to include all of the development activities that a company might be engaged in. That might be survey work, it might be site visits, auto work, audit, it might be um, you know, visiting ports in New York City for site assessments for an offshore wind project uh, or uh, talking to landowners about leases. And your understanding is that all of those activities would be covered, is that right? Yeah, yeah and this is Doreen. Oh, sorry, David. Oh, um, you, you go ahead, sorry. No, that, that interpretation is, is correct, Anne, that um, 
everything needed to bring a project forward um, from the beginning through construction um, is, is covered. Thanks so much. Yeah. Keep in mind, they need to wear a mask and they need to yeah. abide by the, the contractor guidelines from Department of Health. Just because they're allowed to move forwards doesn't mean, you know, they, they still have to abide by those measures. That's mm -hmm. all. I know you know that. I just want to echo that over and over again. Well, it's worth saying again. And um, finally, do we know, I know this particular webinar does not address energy efficiency. Do you guys know if there is going to be one that will? Yes, there definitely will be. Um, Doreen, do you know if Janet's having that next week? I know they're putting that together and I, I think it might be next week. You know, while we're running this webinar, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll reach out and figure that out. I know they were working to schedule one, but now I don't know if it has been. So um, please stand by, thank you. Sure thing, and thank you all of you at NYSERDA for for all your flexibility with the program since we've been in the middle of this and for all your focus on it. Thanks so much. Sure. Um, Denise, do you have a question? Sure. Um, Denise from New York. Thank you very West. much. Sure. I, I, um, I will echo everyone else's, my colleagues. Thanks to David Doreen and Jason. Um, this webinar is helpful in terms of really providing more clarity around what's, what's allowed and what isn't. It's really helpful. Um, I guess my, our questions really um, go back a little bit to April when uh, back to the first webinar, so it's slightly out of the construction scope. But with respect to, um, you know, we, we were very appreciative, the industry has been very appreciative of NYSERDA, um, you know, pushing back milestones um, and making it easier for um, contractors to meet milestones. One of the things that we raised in our recommendations for how to jumpstart the industry or keep things going during COVID had to do with the local government approval. And I know that we, we've we talked about this and my colleagues in, in the other uh, trade associations have had this issue also. But just in terms of, um, well, two, two aspects, um, you know, working with local governments to help facilitate approvals and then potentially, at least in the storage realm, looking at um, waiving the requirement for local government seeker approval prior to locking in incentive dollars um, and whether consideration could be given to that to allow for projects to get the rest of their financing and keep moving forward. So I, I needed to raise that because that's still a, an issue for our industry. Jason, would you mind fielding that? I, I had to jump on <laughs> someone else real quick. Yeah, no, 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 no problem. No, no problem. Um, so, Denise, the short answer to that is it's definitely something that we we are aware that it's a point you've raised before from New York Best on behalf of the storage industry. Um, it wasn't a decision that we made lightly when we put that requirement in place to require planning and zoning board and a approved special use permit before a storage project, a, a large storage project would be awarded. Um, that's, that's something that really is the case outside of New York City where it's more relevant. And it was aligning the program with New York Sun. And so we actually debated that quite extensively back in the last part of 2019 into early 2020 before we submitted that change. Nothing that we have seen yet, and this certainly could change, is causing us to think that removing that uh, requirement is going to have more positives that outweigh the negatives that would come with potentially a lot of projects that get awards, that tie up money, mm -hmm. that close blocks, and then a trip because they can't receive the approvals. Right. We're, we're definitely following it really closely, Denise and mm -hmm. absolutely continuing to work with the local governments. Um, but at this time, it's not something that we're planning to change. Okay, I appreciate that. And, and, and um, obviously monitoring the situation, we'll, we'll share with you if, as, as we hear from folks, if they start to have problems. So we, we definitely appreciate that. Okay, um, please my, do. My, my second item, and I, I, I feel bad because this is a, it's not a nicer to question, but I, 
I don't have a place to go with this, <laughs> except I wanted to raise this. Um, we've heard from some companies that the NIPA has stopped its clean energy contractor work through September. And um, the confusion, and I, I guess I'm, ra I'm raising this more in hopes that maybe NYSERDA can talk amongst the rest of the energy agencies about some, par some consistency among the clean energy world, um, just from the perspective of, you know, having a consistent approach on work that contractors are doing, clean energy contractors are doing. So just, I just wanted to share that feedback that we received um, from one of our companies and in hopes that we can get to some consistency between the agencies. Yeah, and I, um, I think right now we have about 20 minutes left on the webinar, we still have to get to Erica and get through a lot of questions, which I want to make sure we get through all of them. Is that something we can take offline, Denise? Oh, sure, absolutely. Okay. And I, like Thank I said, you. I didn't expect you to answer it today, so I, okay. but I, I felt the need to raise it as it was part of what came into me when I asked members for questions. So happy to take to deal with, deal with that after the fact. And again, thanks to to all of you for putting this together. Sure, Erica Nadowski, how are you? Good, good. Just confirming that you can hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Great. Thanks, David. Um, echo my colleagues' um, words of uh, thanks and appreciation to the um, NYSERDA team. Um, gl glad that we've reached the point to have this webinar. Um, uh, we also definitely appreciate the um, consistent weekly communication that you've all set up with us um, as part of the COVID Solar Task Force, um, and, and that's been a really valuable way for us to, to share information and um, bring it back to our, our membership. So I do have a couple of questions. Um, I, I wanted to, looking forward to phase two reopenings, um, take up the issue of what kind of activities are um, being considered and contemplated for phase two and whether there's any separate um, you know, set of metrics that the state is looking at um, in that regard. And, and I raise that um, just because of the fact that in-person sales activities have, have obviously been you know, halted. Um, those are important for residential, for CDG, and, and our you know, cannot take place in, in phase one. So any separate metrics or uh, thoughts around what would be considered in phase two? Yeah, um, as far as timing, you know, I think as I said um, earlier, phase two can happen at a minimum two weeks after phase one has been approved in that region and most likely will happen if everything remains green. Um, I don't remember what exactly is in phase two. Um, Do you want me to pick yeah, that up, David? Please, thank you. Yeah, so the, a lot of questions relate to this and the website that I would look at is the holy grail is forward.ny.gov, so forward.ny.gov. And on the top, there's a lot of links that you can click on um, for everything from where the regional councils are how to send a question if it's not clear through an email address, who the members are. And then to answer this question, the four phases are spelled out. So for purposes of this group, um, the things that would be covered in phase two is professional services, full retail, administrative support, real estate, rental and leasing. So professional services like law firms and finance and things like that would all be covered. Um, just to follow on that, David, there were some questions about segmenting within construction. And just to reiterate the point you made, construction in, and for these purposes, NYSERDA projects in construction is really everything related to getting that project built in the field. If it's uh, siting work that has to happen or, or re, uh, field work that needs to occur, uh, that, that's all included. Great, thank you, Jason, for that. Um, I'll take a look at that as a resource and certainly um, draw attention to it to our members who haven't.
looked at it. Um, second, and, and this is more of a confirmation question, I feel like you all have been very, very clear um, in, in your directions on this, um, but in terms of who needs to fill out the attestation form, I just want to, you know, bring this home, uh, just confirming that it's the contractor, not the developer. Um, the contractor would also include any subcontractors, um, and also that it's just one individual per company. So in other words, every employee of the company it needs to be familiar with the on-site requirements, but every employee does not need to attest um, that they've received, reviewed, the documents. I think you, I think I know the answer to that question, but just want to confirm that. Yeah. Um, one person from each company needs to attest. And we also got another, it's not everybody. Um, it's up to that one person, obviously, to make sure that the communication happens within their company, but that only one person needs to do the attestation. And it's also important. You only have to do one attestation. You don't have to do it for every project. You can do that attestation for uh, many, many projects until maybe they ask you to do another one if the rules change. So it's a one time only situation. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Um, is it OK? Do you have any other questions or should we move to um, what I love? The best uh, part of this is hearing Jason Doling do a rapid response Q&A uh, portion here. It's like listening to um, you know a, a very talented individual who can just answer all these questions right away it's like an auction <laughs> <laughs> all right let's do our best so i'm going to try to hit a number of these in the lightning round and my coworkers are all speaking up in the background because somebody rang the doorbell so i apologize for that um okay so from the top um we had a question, does NYSERDA have plans to help contractors procure PPE? At this time, we, we don't have the ability to do that. I have seen um, reports of either the State Business Council or local chambers of commerce looking to do that to help companies that are located in their region. That's the best guidance that I have to offer at, at this time. We are confirming that a single worker a provision does cover service work and does cover um, audit work that could include uh, could occur in the field. We have another question. Um, what can be done if the utility is not resuming work uh, such as interconnection and things of that nature? And that's a tough question. Um, there's there's really nothing that NYSERDA can do in that case. So when the guidance came out that said any NYSERDA construction outside of uh, residential solar is eligible to begin um, with the exception of New York City, the utilities do have the right to decide they want to be more stringent. So in the case of Con Edison, if they've decided as a company that they are not willing to start field work uh, for anything that's non-essential in their case until phase one begins that that is their right so the utility does have the ability to to follow uh what what they feel is the safest protocol uh one one question that... <laughs> bear with me one second that's all you need is a doorbell with four dogs in the house right <laughs> I think I can uh, hit the next question. I think, Chris, are we at question seven? Is there a method for contractors to verify that subcontractors have submitted the attestation? Will we need to fill out an attestation form every construction project we perform while the state is opening or just one company? Um, I, I don't think there's any public um, page that's going to tell you all the companies that have done the attestation. It would really be up to you to make sure that they have done it um they do they will get proof 
once you send it in that they've done it. So you could just ask your subcontractors to submit the proof that they've uh, done the attestation. And as I said earlier, it is just one attestation. Uh, you don't have to keep doing it for every project. Um, I think the next one is slide. You need me to take back over or are you going strong? Um, depends on the uh, barking um, level in the background there. So you let me know. That uh, <laughs> remains to be seen. <laughs> we, have a, we have a question about pre-construction activities um, regarding the safety plan. So if there is a lone worker on a site, the safety plan, David, that you mentioned must be prepared and available from the Department of Health guidance. Uh, can you speak to whether that is once there is more than one worker on a site? Um, which question is that? Is that 16? 16, yep. Yeah, so it, the question is, um, do you have to have the safety plan on site if it's more than one worker or less than one worker? If it's only one worker. I I don't think the safety plan has anything to do with the number of workers so i would, I would assume yes uh, open-minded to hearing it. anybody else's thoughts on our end i mean that one worker could run into other people that enter the site um, that are not a part of the construction so they need to know what the rules of the game are too so i would i would i would guess yes Yeah, that's the same interpretation I would take. Um, the Once that safety plan is devised, it likely is going to cover all types of projects where that field work is occurring. So it would be a, a template that could be used. Okay, I'm gonna hit a couple of additional questions. Um, one relates to NYSERDA inspections. As people know, our quality assurance inspections had been paused and they remain paused. Um, we do not yet have an estimate as far as I'm aware of when those visits are expected to resume, uh, but we'll certainly keep contractors aware as that continues to evolve. Was that question 21? Uh, that was question 21. Do we still have Doreen on or had, did she have to drop? I'm here. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, so we're on the question that um, I knew was going to be asked. Is that the one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yeah. Well, at least Anne didn't ask it. So thank you, Anne. Um, <laughs> no, the question was about our uh, our to be issued uh, tier one solicitation for um, for 2020, and um, you know. I, as described when we had had initially communicated the fact that it was not advisable to issue the RFP as scheduled in it toward the end of April. Um, frankly, we're really, really pleased to see the progress that we are making and has been discussed um, thus far on this webinar. Which is really all of the flags, all the markers that we were looking for in order to begin the process to get this RFP on the street. Are, are being advanced now. You know, we're we're now in a situation as discussed where people can do their work, um, people can advance their projects, and obviously um, can do so in a way that brings the best projects and best prices forward for New Yorkers. So um, we're actively working on the timing to issue the RFP now. Now that we're seeing um, the the state advance um, as described, so we hope um, we'll have good news soon. Um, and and We'll certainly be in touch when we do. Thanks, Doreen. Thank you. You want to hit the, I think there's one more, right, Jason? Yeah, there's another question. It's come up a few times on the attestation. Just to be clear, we're asking contractors to maintain that attestation on site. It's not something that we're asking you to send to us. You don't need to upload it within uh, Salesforce. It needs to be available if it's asked for. Otherwise, you do that directly with Department of Health. Okay, I think that rounds out all the questions. Um, 
and we have six minutes to spare here. I'm going to pause. If you want to ask another question in the next few minutes, feel free to do so. We'll hang on for a minute here to see if there's any more questions. Um, and if any of our trade groups have any further questions, now would be a good time to ask as well. Okay. All right. Well, I think we've covered everything. Um, I just want to thank everybody for joining um, True Partnership, Public-Private Partnership here. Um, glad we were able to combine forces with the large-scale renewable team, both Doreen and Abby, um, on this webinar, and um, also with the trade groups to put this together. Um, we do lean on the trade groups to sort of make sure that they understand uh, everything going on in such a changing environment and that they relay that information to their members. So membership with the trade groups is essential, especially during times like this when uh, times are, you know, every day is a different day and the, and the different rules. So uh, thank you everybody for joining. We will make this available as soon as possible. In the meantime, you can go to the NYSERDA website and a lot of those links that we provide here will be available there uh, right now. All right. So thank you very much and um, look forward to talking to you again under better conditions, we hope.